It's great to be in the month of February. I'm glad that we've made it through January. We're here. <laughs> so it's great to see you today. And if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us as well. Um, and if you're new with us, we're happy to have you here too. Um, I'm going to start us off this morning by reading from Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness. For your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. Every king in all the earth will thank you, Lord, for all of them will hear your words. Yes, they will sing about the Lord's ways, for the glory of the Lord is very great. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. Though I'm surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand and the power of your right hand saves me. The Lord will work out his plans for my life and your faithful love, O oh Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you made me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be together, to gather together as believers and to praise you and to lift your name high above every other name. God, you deserve all the praise. And so for that, we thank you. We thank you for allowing us to be gathered together in this place. And Lord, for those who are joining us online, I just pray that your presence would be so strong, that they would feel you, that they would know you right where they are. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand to worship this morning.
That's great. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Amen. Okay, uh, you guys can be seated. Um, just uh, g give a wave to, to our friends all across the room today. And we are glad, we are so glad that you guys are here. And if you are joining us at home on the internet, uh, please just leave a comment so that way we can see who is with us. So I have just a few, well, a couple announcements. We have a lot of stuff going on this month. So uh, the last thing, or the first thing is to sign up for the church directory uh, pictures. I thought it was by tomorrow, but she said, if you can get it by Tuesday, as early as Tuesday morning, Cindy can take um, a uh, time slot for that. So sign up for the church directory. Um, see her for that, or if you want to do it through the app, you can do that, except you cannot do that until after midnight because it does not work on the weekend. So please get sign up and get your pictures taken. And then we are having a Super Bowl party. That is next Sunday, February 13th. Uh, bring some snacks and some drinks. Uh, it starts at 530. We're going to be in here. It's going to be great, and we're just going to have a good time. And then on Monday after, that's Valentine's Day, okay, so February 14th, we will be having our Valentine's Banquet. Tickets are $10 for adults and $5 for uh, students and children. And um, you can sign up, uh, call the church, please call the church to just let us know if you're going to come so that way we can get a good head count on that. And I was told it is lasagna that we're having for dinner, so that's going to be great. Um, yeah, so you can also, we'll make it available to where you can pay for that online. And then the last thing we kind of have going for now, uh, on February 20th from 5 to 7 p.m., we'll be having Nerf and nachos, okay? Bring your Nerf gun, but please don't bring your, your own bullets we will have plenty of that, okay? And this is going to be great. And yeah, so let's, um, that's what I have for announcements. So let's stand up and worship in song again.
Amen. It is so great to be gathered together in the Father's house today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your presence that's here among us this morning. God, you are so good, and we just want to praise you today. Lord, I do think of those who are at home, who are unable to be here today because of sickness, because of illness. Lord, I pray that you would be with them where they are. Lord, they need your healing touch, and we believe that you are a God of miracles. Like Pastor Gavin talked about last week, maybe sometimes we find ourselves a little bit cynical, or maybe we question, did you really do that? But God, help us to believe. Help us to claim today that you are the good Father, that you are the God who can heal. So Lord, I just pray, especially over Joyce today, and I think of Jerry and Mo, God, would you just be, them, be with them right where they are? with Dave Johnson. God, you are such a good God, and we claim that today. Lord, I know that many of us in this room have praises, things that we could testify about. And so, Lord, we just want to say today that we believe you are the good Father, that you are the one who provides. And Lord, I pray for Pastor Gavin as he comes up this morning, that you would speak through him that you would help us to have ears to hear what it is that you have for us today. Help us to not miss what we need to hear. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Kids, today is family worship. And so we're going to stay in the congregation and intentionally worship with our parents. And afterwards, at the end of the service, if you will come and find me, I have a prize for all of you. Just for the kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, uh, I just want to welcome you again to church this morning. Um, I, I know that I probably say this too much and it just kind of sounds like anything, but this is where you're meant to be. Um, taking this intentional time to come together and say, these are the people that I'm with. This is the place that I am. This is the God that I serve. So welcome to the house of the Lord today once again. Um, just before we do get into the message today, I want to kind of throw up our PowerPoint we've been um, looking at just a little bit, um, trying to do this over time. Kate, could you go all the way to the one that lists like the phases, like so the first phase? I don't know, it's a few in there. Yeah, phase one. So you can see that um, there's going to be several parts of this process, and what we want to make sure that we're doing in the beginning is... Uh, we want to dedicate time to prayer and fasting for this. And so I want to ask you, I know fasting is a practice that's kind of neglected in, in most of modern, the modern church's life, um, but I want to encourage you to consider fasting. I'm not going to ask you to fast a whole day, but if you could consider uh, fasting one meal this week and, and every week into the coming months, uh, one meal that we could dedicate that time to prayer, um, the Lord often works through those kinds of commitments, and I believe that... Um, um, this is an important part at this stage in the process as we consider whether or not the Lord uh, would have us to build a building. So um, the next point then, uh, listen to God's call and see, seek God's vision, right? We are going to eventually, we have our yearly meeting come up, coming up on the 27th, and the point of that is to tell you um, not all the statistics of our church throughout the year, but uh, where we believe the Lord has taken us. And so we want to know, is the Lord taking us to a place that would eventually end up in another building? And again, not moving, but uh, adding to this space. Um, we want to make the best use of the current space that we have. You may not know this, but there's been a bit of a shakeup in the rooms that we're using where we store stuff, where the kids meet, where the teens are. Um, that might continue to move and change as we want to be the best stewards of what we currently have um, so that we can really see is a, a, a new space justified, an additional space even justified. Um, yeah, we have to get district approval to be able to do that. And the best way for us to have district approval, these are our leaders who are um, kind of above us there, the best way to do that is for us to be unified and have a good vision. So we want to continue to do that. I don't know if there's another point there. We're going to take us to the next one. Yeah, let's end it there. Thank you so much, Kate. So um, that's where we're at right now. Help us as we continue to do so. There will be a time where we scheduled to get together, and we can just give out all our ideas about what kind of space do we want and need. We want to be sure to listen to you uh, together with the leadership and our elected members of the church board, but um, 
Um, just keep, for now, would you keep in prayer over that process? Okay? Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and look, um, turn to the scripture today. Uh, well, before we jump right into the scripture, I want to tell you, we talked about a couple weeks ago, I, sometimes the Lord does this to me. I don't plan a series for you. I don't plan it out, but the Lord just kind of gives me, I'll, I'll be three weeks in, and I'll be like, oh, this is a series. <laughs> We're in the middle of a series. The Lord is working on me, and therefore the Lord gets to work on you too. I hope that's the way that it works. But um, we talked about the, the gospel being good news for all people, right? The gospel must be good news for all people uh, in order for it to be good news for some people. We also talked about um, living out and speaking the word. And so when God does something to us or for us, we have to be able to recognize it and speak it for what it is. But then we also have to be a part of making sure the good news is, is carried out in our, in our acting, in our living, in our being, and the scripture that the Lord brought for me today or to me this week for today um, really kind of continues that on, but we want to think about the revelation of God. When God reveals himself to you or to us or to any group of believers, it is not just so that you can have a warm fuzzy, although I will confess that that is part of it. The great theologian John Wesley mentioned that when the Lord came to him in a unique way, he was strangely warmed, what we might call a warm fuzzy. I don't know what that means, but he was strangely warmed. That is good and right, but also after this strange warming, there has to be something that comes from me, uh, out of me as a testimony to the fact that God revealed himself to me. Or God revealed himself to us as a people uh, who gathered together. And, and if he does that, it's for a purpose. So I want to just tell our big idea for today, and that is uh, the gospel is a story that, be that begs to be received, repeated, and expanded. Okay, the gospel is a story that begs to be received, repeated, and expanded. And we're going to get into that um, God definitely reveals himself to us for a purpose, and it's kind of like that, um, I don't know, one of the best movies from my childhood was The NeverEnding Story. Do you know this movie? The Never, yeah, The NeverEnding Story, good. Even some, even this generation knows it. And so The NeverEnding Story is, is basically, if I can tell it in a couple sentences here, it's this fantasy journey. This boy is reading a book, and, and it takes us between the boys reading the book time to what's actually happening in the story of the book. And eventually what happens at the end of the story is the boy becomes a part of that story. And he's reading it, and he's like, no, it's not talking about me. And the, the, the story is basically like, yes, we are talking about you. Your name is Bastion, and we need your help. And um, I... I don't know. I think they stole that straight from the New Testament. I'm not joking. We read about it. We hear it. We're like, yeah, that's amazing. And then all of a sudden we realize the Spirit is speaking to us and telling us this story is also about you. You belong in this story. And guess what? I need your help. Amen? All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 1 through 11, I love this passage. Before the creeds were the creeds. You know the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed is longer, you probably don't know that one. Before the creeds were creeds, we had this passage. And so let's go ahead and just read it all the way through. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the, the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his work uh, and his grace toward me 
has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. And this is the word of the Lord. You know, in, in the context of, of Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians is, is really kind of a misnomer because the original book is what we come today to call 2 Corinthians. That's the original Corinthian letter to Corinth. If you didn't know that, now you know. So that was the original one. And actually what happened was they took, the, they, they took that, that first letter and they expanded it and, and, and they, they added to it and they made it kind of more, more theological, more fancy sounding. And then, and, and then they sent that back out to the church. And so the first one was probably definitely delivered specifically to the believers in Corinth and when Paul and, and some other leaders got a hold of, hold of it and they added to it and expanded it, the new revised edition, if you will, they sent that back out, but this time it went to everybody. And so um, we have a lot of very s- significant things happening, but the main issue that Paul is dealing with from chapter 1 through 14 is, is uh, division. Division in the church based on how we see the role of males and females. Division in the church based on whether we're Jews or Gentiles. That means people who were direct um, descendants of Abraham or people who could not have that ancestral claim. Um, They had differences on whether or not um, people were going to eat meat uh, offered to idols or not. And so they have all these differences, all these divisions and, and, and... Paul is practically dealing with all these things, giving practical answers, and then he kind of gets to this point, and he says, now here, let me lay it out for you theologically, or let me lay this out. I mean, there's theology all throughout, but let me lay the theoretical foundation for you so you can understand why we're united, why we do what we do, why we are who we are. The reason is, is because God came to earth in Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ suffered for our sins, but you know what? He was also raised from the dead, and he handed on this gospel to us. And because he handed on to us, nothing else matters. What matters now is that we are resurrection people. Sounds like a message that we should have on Easter Sunday. We're resurrection people. Maybe we'll get back to this. But the truth is that whatever was before... Whatever might cause division, whatever might cause timidness or meekness, whatever might cause you to be sinful or impure or unholy and however we define those things, whatever they are, that's a thing of the past because now we're resurrection people. We are sucked into this gospel story. It doesn't, we don't just read about the, whole, the, the, the great Christian heroes that went before us, the apostles, uh, the disciples, all these other people, the great gospel writers. We don't just think about them. We also realize that we are sucked into that story and we stand beside them in faith and carry on this gospel message. And that is a scary task. <laughs> That's a scary task, and you have Paul's revelation as he's going through, and he says, um, or Paul's uh, speaking about him receiving the gospel. He says, you know, that Jesus appeared first to, the, to, to Cephas, which is Peter. Uh, Cephas is Peter. Uh, Cephas means rock. He names him rock on whom I will build this church, and, um, and so he kind of gets called rock sometimes or Peter sometimes. Um, and so then he says he appeared to, to the other 12 and then to the 500 and then uh, to these people, those people. And then finally, he appeared even to me. This gospel was handed over even to me. When Jesus Christ is revealed to you, whether he's revealed to you at the altar, he's revealed to you as you are reading scripture, he's revealed to you as you are worshiping in, in music or, or whatever way it's possible, Lord, to be revealed to you. When he does that, it is for a purpose. And the purpose is for putting you now right squarely in line with this gospel story and saying, now it's your turn. Carry it on. Hand it over to somebody else. And this is why we're here, because we're resurrection people. So the gospel isn't a, isn't a static thing. We don't hear it and say, oh, this is a story that happened. This is what happened uh, 2,000 years ago or 
however long ago we might say, I mean, there's some debate, give or take 30 years, um, so 2000, uh, this is what happened and it's done. No, the, that, that story carries on and it's, it's often been said that, that we're that next chapter, we're that next book. Revelation is not the end, uh, we call it Revelation in English, but I think nearly every other language calls it apocalypse. This is the end. And, 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 and the English Bible people who had a say, they didn't like that. It's not the end of the story. It is just another revelation is kind of uh, an understanding of what God is doing, has done, and, and will continue to do. And so we can't call it the apocalypse. We can't call it the end. We have to just um, leave that open to say, so far, the gospel isn't over. The gospel is, is a 2,000-year-old story. It continues on through the church today. That is why we exist, because we are resurrection people. So the gospel is not static. It is in motion, passing from hearer to hearer, as we each proclaim what we have received in both word and deed. Um, there's that fam famous quote from St. Francis of Assisi. If you don't know who that is, he's a famous old holy guy. And famous old holy guy Francis said, uh, proclaim the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. That's a good quote. I like that. Um, I don't know if he actually said that. I mean, he definitely didn't say it in English, um, but he didn't speak English, I don't think. Um, I don't even know if anyone spoke English back then. But anyway, um, when he said this, the idea was that we need to say it, we need to proclaim the gospel in word and deed. It is really easy to say, yes, Jesus loves me, I know this, I'm going to be transformed by His grace, by His love and His power, but to actually go then and live like Jesus is a much more difficult thing. And so if the two of them aren't walking hand in hand, then there's a problem. We have to be able to say that my words match my actions. If I receive the good news, either I receive the gospel message either in a group like this or in some sort of small group or one-on-one, -on -one. Um, no matter how I received it, that makes me also a gospel bearer, one who carries the gospel. When we speak about the gospel meaning good news, but we have to realize the gospel was a word that was used, it was a regular part of the, the Greek vocabulary. And so people would say, hey, have you heard the gospel today? I say, oh, what's the gospel? The gospel is Caesar conquered another army, and now uh, we're, the Roman Empire has grown. Oh, praise be to Caesar. And, and, and this is what they would say. Have you heard the gospel? What's the, what's the gospel today? The gospel today is my daughter had a child. Oh, oh praise, you know, whoever they, they praise. And so, so what, what has happened here is the church of Jesus Christ has said, this word gospel is now our word. It belongs to us because there will never be another good news, there will never be another word that is as good as the fact that God loved us so much that he came to live amongst us, that he died for our sins, he was resurrected that we may have power, and he sends us out onto his mission. There will never be another news as good as that news. So we just steal that word. That's our word now. We own the word gospel. That belongs to us. And so Paul says here, I, I passed on, and the, the verbiage that he, used, that he uses here with this regular word of gospel, he says, I have gospeled the gospel. I have gospeled the gospel. And you wonder, if you didn't know this, pastors and, and, and gospel writers, we, or, or, you know, and, and, and theologians, a different type of people, we get to make words up. This is one of the perks of the job. We get to make a word up that hasn't previously existed, and Paul does that here. He uses gospel as a verb. He says, I have gospeled the gospel. I have received it. I have I have, I, have, I have realized it's a part of me and I'm a part of it. And guess what? I'm good newsing the good news. I'm spreading the good news. I'm, the word that he used in the translation that we read is, I'm handing on what was handed over to me. I'm handing it on to others. I've received this. It's become a part of me and I have it. And now I'm giving it to somebody else. But there must be evidence that the gospel is present in our lives. There must be evidence of it. It has to be received, right? The gospel has to be received, has to be repeated, has to be expanded. 
So what's the evidence of the gospel in my life? Yes, we can speak about, <laughs> I've been going through this, this class with things that we don't do and things that we, that we do. Um, you'll know that if you're in the, in the member class. But uh, we don't just define our holiness or our, our connection to God through things that we don't do. We have to define it by the things that are coming out of us and kind of coming out of our lives. And so some of that is, is spiritual disciplines. Some of that are, are the things like fruits of the Spirit, or, or the Bible says fruit of the Spirit. It expects them all to be there. You can't say, well, I'm not very loving, but I'm super patient, so I've got it. No, you have, to, you have to exhibit them all. They all have to be flowing from your life if you are a Spirit-filled, Christ-following uh, servant of the Lord. So there has to be evidence that comes from us, and some of that's going to be stuff that does seem legalistic. Well, I have to go to church. Well, Nobody says you have to go to church to be a Christian, but I'll tell you, well, no, I'll, I'll go back there. You have to be a church to go to Christian. You don't have to be, you don't have to, let's rewind. You can believe in God and not go to church. And, and our society especially is filled with tons of people who believe in God but aren't necessarily Christians. It is very hard, I will say, to be a Christian without a church because we need each other. We need opportunities to serve one another, to love one another. We need the, the resources and knowledge and spirit-filledness of a group to be able to say, we're ministering to these, this place or to these people. And it's harder to do that alone than it is to do that in a group. And not that you need a group of 1,000 or 500 or 100 to be a part of a church, but uh, it's hard to make that step from believer to Christian, which aren't the same things, to be a believer to a Christian. Um, it's most easily done and almost impossible to do without uh, the confines of the church. Confines sounds bad. <laughs> the group of the church, right? Um, Have you found yourself in the gospel lately? Have you read a story of, of the Spirit of God moving? Have you seen how God saved someone or healed someone or touched someone you said, and have been able to say, that's my story? I mentioned a story last week of a man who was on his deathbed and, and, and after prayer uh, was able to, to stand up and walk out of the room. It doesn't have to be that miraculous. It doesn't have to be a life and death situation, but sometimes it is. It might not be through laying on hands of prayer, but I know that we have known people in this group who, who the doctors and medical science said they are beyond hope, and yet they're a part of our community today. That is a Lazarus story. If we can see that our, the gospel is our story, and we see ourselves, as I keep looking to this like it's my Bible, but if we are able to open the Bible and read the stories, and, and the good news is, is, is retroactive, and so we claim all of the Old Testament as well. That was another important thing. We don't say, now that we have the gospel, we just take these new stories. No, we claim those old stories, and we say, this is what God has done in the Old Testament, and we find the good news repeated over and over and over again. This is why Paul says, that Jesus came according to the Scriptures. Jesus suffered and died according to the Scriptures. Jesus was resurrected from the dead according to the Scriptures. This isn't something that God decided that, that, was, that was separate from the faith of the past. They, God unites those things with the good news. And so we say, you can look to the Old Testament and New Testament, and if you see the Spirit of the Lord moving in the life of an individual there, and you say, this is also my story, then that's the good news. So I want to ask you if you've, if you've allowed yourself to realize that, hey, the story of Gideon is my story. The story of Joseph is my story. The story of Esther is my story. And when we're able to do that, it's a lot easier to go on and to share those stories and say, here is what God did in the life of Ruth. Here's how God did the same thing in my life. And as we live that out and speak that and continue to share that, God is able to move through us in a mighty way. 
And so I want to tell you a couple things here as we move towards the end. When the pastor tells you we're moving towards the end, it doesn't really mean anything, but um, we're moving towards the end, guys. So um, the fact that you believe, your believing is your calling, and your baptism is your commissioning. Some people say, well, I'm not sure the Lord wants to use me, or my past was bad, so, they, so that couldn't be used. Paul had a terrible past. He might have been righteous in the eyes of some followers of God, but he was killing people. And he was happy about it. He was persecuting the church. And he was, he was doing this, and the Lord chose him, even him, he says. God chose even me because I was a terrible person, and things I had done were terrible, and yet God chose me. I guarantee you there's nothing in your past that is worse than that. And so Paul is basically saying he appeared to all these good, holy people that you know about. Then he also appeared to a sinner like me in a way to say that, yes, you don't have to wonder if you're called. The fact that you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, the fact that you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, the fact that he has revealed himself to you in as much as you know he exists, that is your calling. You are called to serve him. Then hopefully at some point in your life, after you've confessed it, and many of us have done that through the altar, but as you've confessed your sins and, and placed your hope and trust in Jesus, eventually there would be a point at which you were baptized. And if you haven't been baptized and you want to be baptized, definitely come talk to me. We're going to have a baptism service this Easter Sunday. That's time away, so there's time for us to prepare for that. But I want to let you know that your baptism, if you can say that you were baptized, what that means is you were commissioned you were sent out into the kingdom at the moment of your baptism to be a servant of the Lord. So if you haven't been baptized, it's not a way to say, okay, great, <laughs> I'm not sent, I'm going to find you. We're going to come after you and we're going to baptize you. No, I'm, I'm teasing about that, sort of. But um, it's important for you to realize, you can't say, well, I, I've been a Christian and, 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 and I'm not really sure that I'm called to do something beyond just be a good person or just go to church and and, 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 you know, I'm not really sure that I've, I, people are really ready to use me or sent out. If you are believing in Jesus Christ, you can confess that. And if you have been baptized, you have been commissioned out into his service. This is why you exist, because you are a person. We are a people of the resurrection. So Paul adds his story to the gospel story. That's what we need to do today. We need to add our story. We can, we can go through the whole gospel story, everything that, that Christ has done, everything that's accomplished through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, and then we can say, and so, in my life, this. And if you've never had the chance to share your story with someone, um, I would challenge you to, to make that a part of your, your regular practice. Um, the story that, that I think, uh, maybe I've said this in the past couple weeks, but the story I think that goes best with that is, just a story of the prodigal son. If you can tell that story and then you relate to how you have also had wayward times or, or, or difficulties in serving and following the Lord, and, but the Lord still loved you, that communicates the gospel in a very succinct way. So we are people of the resurrection. Handing on the gospel to others makes us a people of the resurrection. And so if we are people of the resurrection, the question then we have to ask ourselves is, are we living lives, the sort of lives that call other people into transformation? Are we a part of that? The reason we exist according to to uh, the scriptures is that we might make Christ-like disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if we are not doing that, either as individuals or as groups, then perhaps we have to ask ourselves, are we living into our jobs as resurrection people? And this is one of the, the reasons churches exist, because it helps us to do that in ways that maybe I can't as an individual. And let me just imagine for you for a second, you think, okay, well, you're the pastor, you're the one that's supposed to do this. Um, let, let's pretend I'm really, really good at this, and I, and I was, had a lot of interaction and, and, and time and to get out into the community and minister to people. And let's say I'm, I'm, a, I'm just great at this, and I'm able to help bring one person to the Lord a week. Let's say I was able to do that. I'm not claiming that. I'm saying let's pretend I was. Um, 
after a year or two or three, um, that's a lot of people to be discipling, right? So even if you think, well, it's a pastor's job to do the, the evangelizing part, that's why he's up there, right? That's why he or she or they are a part of the pastoral staff. That's their job. There's still going to be too many people for us to know all their names, to call them throughout the week, to see how they're doing, to meet with them in Bible study, and this is why the church exists. This is why you exist, to be a part of that, to extend that. So we have different things that we want to do, like small groups or Sunday school or different age-based activities, and those aren't because we want to just fill your time with as many, many different things as possible and keep you busy. We know that you're busy already. The reason we have those things is so that you can not only be Uh, engaged with other believers, but also because eventually you're going to be able to bring somebody with you. Eventually you're going to be able to have a word to say to somebody who's uh, newer to the faith or struggling at a time, and your word will reach them in a way that mine or somebody else's who might be, you might consider a leadership position, can't. So this is why we exist. This is the task of the entire church. And if it sounds like a hard task, uh, it is. But the good news is we don't need alone. Christ promises to be with us every step of the way and to give us the words to say. He's going to give you the words to say. You just have to be willing to say them. And you have to be willing to know that you might give somebody a word and it's rejected and it's thrown back in your face and you'll never know that the next person that speaks to them reaches them based on your word. But you can't know that and you may never know that. But this is how the Lord works and uses us. So I want to invite the the worship team to make their way back up. We're going to prepare our hearts for communion this morning. And often when we think about communion, we we think about forgiveness and and the Lord saved me during this time. But really, communion is very much also about not just the fact that Jesus loves us and has saved us and allowed us to live a transformed life. Communion is also about receiving grace. Receiving love, receiving power. Now, pow- not power that we lord over people. Acts 1 8 says, You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you shall be my witnesses. So, when we speak about power, we're talking about power to do the work of the kingdom. And so, um, I want us to consider, and I, and I know that we've been ending like this the past. Um, the past few weeks, but I want us to consider how might the Lord be leading me as, a, as an individual or how might the Lord be leading me in my family? How can I be more involved um, with this gospel message? Is there someone I'm supposed to hand over the gospel to? I've received it. Someone handed it on to me. And perhaps it would be helpful to, in your times of prayer and reflection and Bible study, to consider who were those people that handed it over to me and how did that happen? And that might be the inspiration that we need to continue to hand it over to somebody else. And the gospel is not something that once we receive it, we hand it over, we lose it. Uh, No, we hand it over and it remains with us and a part of who we are. And that's just based on the nature of what it is. Once we receive it, once we have it, once we live in it, um, it belongs to us forever. It's a part of our story. I want to encourage us, um, as you consider um, what the Lord has done for you, as you consider and and meditate upon the Word and how the Lord has revealed Himself to you, remember that it's, it's not by accident. Remember that the Lord is calling you by the fact that you believe in Him, the fact that, that He was revealed to you, the Lord has called you, but also remember that your baptism was your sending. It's kind of like you're an intern, and once you've been baptized, boom, now you work for us. Now you're getting sent out into the kingdom, sent out into the world for the, for the sake of the kingdom. This is why we exist. I want to ask uh, Pastor Jill and Pastor Brady to come up. They're going to help us distribute the elements this morning. Um, we're set up differently than we have been, but go ahead and, and uh, make two lines uh, down the center. And as we, as we come to the word, or as we, as we come in to the table, I would ask you just to take that 
and return to your seat and continue worshiping in song. image of new wine is what we're going for this morning. The fact that we don't want to cling to something that was old or something from the past. We want to say, Lord, do something new in me today. And whether this is your first time taking communion or your thousandth time or ten thousandth time, we have to believe the Lord can do something new in the revelation of himself and the extending of himself to us. So I want to invite you to just carefully open that top clear layer, only exposing the, the wafer at this time, and remind you that when the disciples were gathered together, 
Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he told them to eat it in remembrance of him each time that they get together. And I want to invite you to do so this morning to your joy and to your salvation. you now to carefully open that second layer, exposing the juice. We're reminded on that same night when Jesus was to gather together, he took the cup and he, he blessed it saying, this is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you. Drink this and remember me each time that you do it. And I want to encourage you to consume this cup now, this drink knowing that this is your commissioning, receiving of his grace, sending you out. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word given to us over and over again. We're thankful that you have done a mighty work in us and that you have called us to be your people here on your earth. If we look to you and say, Lord, why aren't you moving? Why can't we see you? The, the question might be, Lord, the response from you might be that you gave us to the earth. You have set us aside for the earth. So we pray that we see ourselves in your gospel and the good news that we have co-opted and we've said this good news now, this word belongs to us. We're going to go out and we're going to do the work of the kingdom because this is why we exist as resurrection people. And as we take these elements and we remember what they represent, we're filled with a sense of awe and wonder that you thought even of us during that time. And we're continued with a, with a sense of responsibility knowing that you have done something for us so that we can serve you better. We pray that our love for you would grow daily and that that love would spill out into others, into the community, into our church and beyond. For your glory, Lord. Make us new people each and every day. Allow us to receive new mercy and new grace each and every day that we can be a testimony to who you are, who you've been, and who you will be every day in the future. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Go in his peace.